the National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Bad Blood. It is 7 p.m. September 14, 1950. In an isolated house trailer in the fields on the outskirts of Cheney, Texas, Joe Prager, an aircraft worker, is packing a suitcase. There is a knock on the trailer door. Just a second. Howdy, Joe. Oh, howdy, Russ. Ain't you going to ask me in? Yeah, sure. Come on in. See you packing already. That's right. What's on your mind, Russ? Well, Joe, I figured... Two weeks is long enough for old friends to be mad at each other. I come to ask you to shake hands. <laughs> you know, now that you're here, I can't figure out just what we've been mad about. Ain't anybody I'd rather shake hands with than you, Russ. You're my boy. But we ain't never going to talk politics again. <laughs> That's a deal. <laughs> I didn't want you to leave feeling sore at me. Why are you going, anyhow? Why are you pulling out your job, Solid? You're needed here. Well, I didn't want anybody to know about it yet, but... Looks like I'm needed someplace else, too. Oh? Here, read this. Well, going back in the Army, huh? I didn't know you stayed on the reserve list. I'm on it, all right. You talked to him about this out at the plant. After all, you're married now, you got a kid, you're in essential work. Maybe you could get out of it. I thought about it, Russ, but, well, I don't want to get out of it. I got kind of a funny feeling about it, a feeling I've had ever since the kid was born. Like, well... Maybe if I go again now, maybe I can help so he'll never have to go when he grows up. Yeah, I can't argue against that. Not with two boys of my own, one of them pushing 17. It'll have me a plenty worried about him with this Corey, you think? Oh, don't let it get you down, Russ. Boy, will be all right. <laughs> Say, uh, I was just about to fix me some grub. How about joining me? Oh, thanks, but Ella's expecting me home. Uh, say, where's Marge and the baby, anyhow? Oh, she drove the kid up to her mother's today. I got a week more before I report now. Yeah. But well, we sort of figured we'd go away someplace together, just the two of us, you know, till I have to leave. Yeah, well, when are you pulling out of here? Tomorrow, when Marge comes back. Ella would like to see you and Marge before you go. She's been beefing at me ever since you and me fell out. Yeah, Marge's been bulldogging me about it, Well, too. can't you come and have supper with us tomorrow before you go? How about that? That's a deal. Swell. Ella would be tickled. Well, guess I better be getting home the old pay envelope. You need any help with anything? I mean... We got a few dollars for... No, no, thanks, Russ. We'll get by. Well, good luck to you, fella. We'll see you tomorrow, hmm? Sure thing, Russ. Say, if they had a draft somebody, why couldn't they take that brother-in-law of yours? <laughs> All of them? That'd be giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> I know Orville ain't giving any aid and comfort to his department out the plant. If we wasn't short-handed, he wouldn't last ten minutes. Well, good night, Joe. Good night, Russ. Just a second. Did you forget something? Oh, it's you, Orville. Yeah, it's me. Russ was just here. I thought it was him coming back. I know he was here. Been waiting out back long enough, waiting for him to leave. You could have come in. Russ don't buy it. He doesn't like me. Reckon that's your fault, Orville. Oh, sure. Everything's my fault. How come you're sticking up for him? Thought you and him wasn't talking. We are now, and I don't think it's any of your business. What do you want, Orville? Joe, I'm... Need some help. I got my check cashed, and I guess I didn't notice it till I was almost home. I got a hole in my pocket. I lost my pay. 
Do I look like a half-wit to you? Well, I only want... The last time you came to me with that story, you said your pocket was picked. And the time before that, you said you got stuck with a loan you signed for somebody. That's right, Joe. Honest. Stop using the word honest, Orville. Doesn't sound right coming from you. Your money's gone. You lost it in the pay night crap game at Holland. I haven't been near Holland's in weeks. Oh, Joe, you gotta help me. My wife will buck like a maverick under a Brandon iron if I don't bring some money home. You and sis got some side money. I know you have. I ain't denying that, but this is one time you ain't dipping your hand into it. Yeah, take a look at this paper. Go ahead, read it. <laughs> Drafted, huh? You want to play soldier again and leave my sister with a kid to take care of. She and the kid will be taken care of, Orvie. I'll see to that. You never had to give us anything and you never will. Joe, I need money. And I ain't leaving here without it. There's nothing here for you, Orvin. Better try someplace else. I said I wasn't leaving without that money. Well, I reckon you'll be here a long time then, Orvin. You have to excuse me. I'm going to fix my supper. I ain't going to ask you again, Joe. Glad to hear just going to keep ignoring me, huh? Like I wasn't even here. That's right. Maybe I can make you pay a little attention with this. Orville, <laughs> oh, put that down. No, I'm going to help you dish out your supper like this. I told you, I was it. I told you, Joe, I told you. of Joe Prago was discovered when his wife returned to their trailer home early the following day. Sheriff Vern Lamont immediately called for the help of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He joined the sheriff at the scene of the crime shortly after noon. I've kept the whole field blocked off, Jace. Nobody's been near the place except Prager's wife and me and the deputies. Good. Where's the wife? Sitting over there in the car. Tried to get her to go into town to the hotel, but she won't. She's in... In kind of a daze, Shock. That's natural. You want to talk to her? No, it wouldn't help when she's like that. Maybe by the time we've had a look around, she'll break down and cry it out, and then we may be able to get something. Let's have a look inside the trailer. All right. There's a the body, and there's a the murder weapon. Wrought iron frying pan. You won't be able to pull any prints off that. Metal's too coarse. That's why I just let it lay there. Medical examiner estimate the time of death. He figured it was between 6 and 8 o'clock last night. Hmm. Suitcase on the bed, half-packed. Prager trying to run away from something? No, I don't think so. Letter on the table here explains it. It was in the Army Reserve. Called back to duty. I see. Where was he working here? Out of the aircraft plant, other side of town. Spot welder. How come his wife didn't report this until this morning? Well, she was away for the night. They got a baby? Baby oil and nipple jar on the dresser there. Yeah, that's why the wife was away. She took the kid to her mother's up in Abilene. Come back this morning. You check on that? First thing. Got a list of eating places. She stopped at both ways, and she gassed up at a mobile station in Abilene last night after she got there. Well, spots her away from here, all right. Let's check around outside. All right. Will it be okay for the medical examiner to move the body now? Yeah, I think so. How come they parked their trailer out here instead of using one of the parks near town? Save money, I guess. Rents are high with the plant working full blast. Mm, gasoline lamp in the trailer for light, but what'd they do for water? Well, there's a well out back. Used to be a house here some time ago, but it was moved. They had everything they needed to get by. I see. Want to walk out to the road where our cars are? I can send one of the boys into the funeral home to arrange a pickup. All right. Wait a minute, Sheriff. Hmm? Watch your feet. What's the matter? These car tracks up the road to the trailer. Prager's own car, I reckon. Same tracks all over the road from coming and going. A uh, different tire pattern in a couple of the soft spots, though. Look here. Yeah. Overlaps most of the older tracks, but Prager's car tracks go over the strange tread once. Right here. Yeah, I see what you mean. Another car must have driven in here after Ms. Prager left yesterday. And that spot is where she drove over the tracks when she came back this morning. It's the way I measure it. If we can pull a cast off that tread, may help us run down the car. Hey, one of your deputies coming up the road now. That isn't one of my boys. Uh, why'd they let him in? I don't know. Hey, you! Yeah? How'd you get in here? I come to help my sister. Who is your sister? Marge, Prager's wife. He was my brother-in-law. That's why the deputies let me through. All right. 
Your sister's sitting in the car back there. Reckon she does need somebody with her at that. Thanks. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, Ranger? Walk along the edge of the road. Stay out of the tire tracks. Why? Because we're asking you to. Isn't that good enough? Well, I only ask you for a reason, that's all. What's your name? Oh, James. You work with your brother-in-law? Well, yeah, sure. Out at the plant. Not in the same department, though. How'd you know your brother-in-law had been killed? I didn't know. Until I saw your deputies down by the road, and they told me. Isn't the aircraft plant working today? Yeah, sure it is. It's on the other side of town. What brought you out here now? I got a lift out during lunch to see my sister. That'd just about take your whole lunch hour. And more if you didn't catch a ride back right away. You make a habit of hitchhiking out here on your lunch hour? No, of course I don't. And why'd you do it today? What are you asking me all this for? You trying to pin something on me? Reckon that's going to depend on how you answer. Come on, talk up. Well, I... I just... Well, I wanted to ask her about my mother. I knew that she'd been up home, see, and I wanted to find out how my mother was. I see. Your mother been sick? Yeah. No, no, she, she's been all right, I reckon. And why the rush to get out here this afternoon? Why not tonight, after work? Because I wanted to come, that's all. Anything else you want to know? Yes, when did you see your brother-in-law last? I, I don't know, three, maybe four days ago. Not yesterday? No. Not even at work? It's a big plant, Ranger. You and me didn't even work in the same building. What time did you quit yesterday? Five o'clock. Then you weren't working between, say, six and eight o'clock last night? No. Then where were you at that time? And who was with you? Well, I, I cashed my check at Holland's and, and then... And then what? Did you come out here? Yeah. What? I said yes, yes, I come out here. I'd have told you before if you hadn't started to question me so funny. Why'd you say you hadn't seen Prager in three or four days if you saw him last night? I didn't see him last night. Listen, you just told us I you came out here. I told you I'd come out here, but I didn't see Joe. I changed my mind about going in because there was a car parked here. Joe had company. Well, that fits in, Jace. Those car tracks. Yeah, but it still doesn't tell us why Orville didn't go in. I'll tell you why, if you let me. I recognized the car. It belongs to Russ Newcomb. And I didn't want to go in while he was there because I didn't want to get mixed up in any argument. Who's Russ Newcomb? And why should there be an argument? Russ works out at the plant, too. Him and Joe have been friends, but they fell out a couple of weeks ago. Hadn't been talking. Then why would Newcomb be visiting here? Why don't you ask Newcomb that? It took a long time for you to suggest that, Orville, considering that Prager's dead and you knew that there'd been bad blood between him and the man you say was here last night. I don't like to throw suspicion on a man for murder, Ranger. But you might have quit suspecting me. A man ain't likely to kill his brother-in-law. Newcomb had the reason, not me. Now, you're going to let me go to my sister, ain't you? Jace. All right, Orville. Go ahead. Yeah. Looks like this thing is cracking easy, Jason. It sure does. You better get out to the aircraft plant. Yeah. We got enough to pick up Newcomb, all right? We got more than that. That tire track on the road matches Newcomb's car. We got enough on Newcomb to send him to Huntsville. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Bad Blood. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We drove out to the aircraft plant. News of Prager's death hadn't reached the place yet. We were directed to Russ Newcomb's section leader, and he pointed Newcomb out to us. He was on a welding job. Hey! Hey, you up there! Newcomb! Yeah! Knock off a minute and come down from that wing, will you? Be right there. What can I do for you? Go into the office where we can talk. Sure, I'll be glad of it. Yeah, Sheriff, what's up? You find a woman who owned that purse? Purse? What purse? What are you talking about? The purse I turned in the office about two months ago. Money in it, don't you remember? Oh, that was on a Sunday. Guess I look different in a workout there. Oh, oh, yeah. What's this about, Sheriff? I thought he looked familiar. Turned in a woman's purse he found in the streets a couple of months back. No identification in it, and the owners never claimed it. Oh? The way you're talking, Sheriff, I reckon it isn't a purse you want to see me about. 
No, it isn't. You know Joe Prager? No, him. Why, Joe's one of my best friends. When did you see him last? Only last night out to his place. Why, what's the matter? Joe in some kind of trouble? You say he was a good friend. Other people say you weren't on speaking terms for the last couple of weeks. We weren't until last night. We, well, we got in a dumb political argument one day during lunch here. Both got hotter than we should have. But you patched it up last night. Yeah, when word got around that Joe was quitting and going away, well, I went out and buried the hatchet. You sure you mean a hatchet, not a frying pan? Look, you fellas asking me something, which ain't telling me nothing. You talked politics again with Prager last night? No, no, he just shook hands, and I asked him to bring his wife over for supper tonight, and then I left, that's all. Prager still alive when you left? Well, what do you mean he was still alive? You telling me Joe Prager's dead? He was beaten to death last night with an iron frying pan. Beaten to death? Joe? You see anybody else at the trailer? No, no, no. We were alone. Just the two of us. Newcomb, the law requires me to warn you that anything you say from here on can be used against you. Used against me for what? You're talking like I'm under arrest. You are under arrest. For the murder of Joe Prager. <laughs> We took Newton back to Cheney and locked him up. Meanwhile, Prager's body had been brought into the funeral home. I went over to see Mrs. Prager to see if she could give further verification of a quarrel between her husband and the man under arrest. Yeah. Joe told me that had some kind of an argument. But I didn't think it would ever be as bad as this. I didn't think Russ would kill him. Why don't you leave her alone, Ranger? I'd already <laughs> told you there was bad blood. Now maybe you'll believe me. Other witnesses aren't going to hurt anything, Orville. I'm all right, Albert. He's got to find out everything he wants to know. What else do they need to know? If you ask me, they got enough of a case right now. If we ask you. But so far, nobody has. And until somebody does, how about keeping quiet? All right. You're the law. Go ahead and make them miserable. I'm going over to Holland, sis. I'll be there if you want me. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep after you like this, Mrs. Prager. Did your husband ever have any trouble with anybody besides Newcomb? No. Was he in fear of anybody, worried about anything? No. He was worried at first when the army letter came. But when we decided it was right for him to go, he didn't worry anymore. Just figured out things so me and the baby could get along. We, we even had a little money saved. We were going away together for a week. Just Joe and me. To the place we went on our honeymoon. We were going to have so much fun. Now I'll have to use that money to bury him. I'm sorry, ma'am. Why did Russ do a thing like this to Joe? Why? Why? I don't know, ma'am. I've never been able to figure out why men do a lot of things they do to each other. <laughs> back to the sheriff's office. It looked like the case against Newcomb was just about closed, but it opened again, opened wide when the sheriff showed me the personal effects that had been removed from Prager's body. Look at this, Jase. Bank book, isn't it? Yep. Prager's. It was in his shirt pocket. Take a look at that last line. Drew out every dime he had yesterday afternoon. Mrs. Prager told me they had some savings. They were going to use it to go away. Reckon that's why he drew it out. Yesterday was payday at the plant, too, Jase, so Prager should have had this amount he withdrew... $312 plus his pay. Wasn't there any money on him? Less than a dollar in change. I had my deputies go out and comb that trailer. Cupboards, dishes. They didn't find a dime. You can turn any money over to the jailer when you booked him? About $5, that's all. But he had time to hide that money. All we got to do is find out where he hid it. If he did hide it. What do you mean? That purse Newcom found a couple of months ago, the one he turned into you. He mentioned that there was some money in it. That's right. A little over $100. What are you thinking? I'm thinking about motives. We've been figuring Newcomb killed Prager because he was nursing a grudge. Robbery angle changes that picture. Yeah. Yeah, it sure does. Fellow who finds money and turns it in when he could keep it isn't likely to kill somebody and steal from him. Unless, of course, he was trying to cover up. He said he'd invited the Pragers to supper tonight, and they were going to come. That's right. You check on Orville's movements last night, see if he was telling the truth? Had my deputy do it. Only place to check was Holland's, and he was there all right after work. 
Cast his check there, like he said, then got in a crap game with some of the boys in the washroom. He couldn't have played very long, or he wouldn't have gotten to Prager's by 7 o'clock when Newcomb was there. I don't get what you're driving at. Orville must have lost in that crap game. A game like that between fellows who work together, the winners usually stick to the end. Yeah. They get sore at a winner who quits until they've had a chance to get even. Do deputies find any sign of bloody clothing when they check Newcomb's place? Nope. But they're checking the cleaning shops now. You know where Newcomb lives? Sure. You want to go over there? Just into the neighborhood. I want to talk to Newcomb's butcher. Come on. Newcomb's butcher? What can he tell you? What Mrs. Newcomb ordered for tonight's dinner? I saw the butcher, and his answer to my question pulled Newcomb back a step away from the electric chair. I got in my car and started to drive toward the field in Prager's trailer. You look like you learned something, Jace. I did. Mrs. Newcomb ordered stew meat yesterday for tonight's supper. She called up this morning and changed the order to lamb chops. Twelve lamb chops. That mean anything to you? And changing from stew meat to lamb chops sounds like she was expecting company. When she orders lamb chops for her own family, she usually gets eight. I see. The other four chops could have been for Prager and his wife then. I think so. And Prager was dead when she ordered them. Well, Newcomb could have told her to order them for a cover-up. Could have. But it's a little too smart. He didn't strike me as being that clever. Yeah, I'm going to go along with that. I think you're right. Well, what do you expect to find at the trailer? I don't know. I want to look around a lot more than we did before. I shouldn't have waited this long. Didn't seem to be any reason for it with the case we had against Newcomb. Well, there's a reason now. We need a new case, and I got a hunch which way it's going to point. I don't know, Jace. We've fine-combed that trailer, and there's nothing we didn't see before. And the only strange car track you found on the road was Newcomb. Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Somebody was sitting down here by the well. Leaned back against it and had his feet stretched out. You can see where the edges of his heels were resting on the ground. Yeah. Circle out around the back here. Let's do a little trail cutting. You figure the killer took off away from the road? If he was on foot, it'd be his best bet. If he went to the highway and walked, somebody might have seen him. If he had blood on his clothes, he'd steer clear of town until it was late and everybody was sleeping. You're all right, Jake. Which way do you want me to go? Circle out that way. I'll work from this side. Okay. Hey, Jake. Yes, yeah, Sheriff? Orville was on foot. I know he was. That's why we're looking. <laughs> found the trail just as it was getting dark. It led me into open country. I got my horse charcoal from the trailer behind my car while the sheriff went to a nearby farm to borrow a mount. It was dark when he caught up to me. You still on the trail or are you cutting to pick it up? I lost it a couple of times further back, but I'm on it now. You know this country back here? Oh, I've ridden it before. You'll be coming to the Horner River soon, about a half mile farther. River angles toward town, doesn't it? Sure does. Cuts under that bridge just outside Cheney. That may be the way the killer followed to get back to town. Let's ride for the river bank and see if we can pick up tracks there. May save us time. Good idea. Big boy. Ah, come on, oh, Charky. We found tracks on the bank, all right. Just a few that led to the edge of the water, and that was all. We cut back and forth on both banks for hours before we picked up a sign. He'd come out of the river on rock, and we barely spotted the place where he'd marked the ground again. That's it, all right, Jace. Same heel impression. He had us fooled for a while, all right. Now let's go. Come on, Sharky. Yeah, come on, boy. What's that up there ahead? Looks like a shack of some kind. I don't know, Jace. Quite a few shacks in here along the river. A lot of deer around. Some folks keep places for fishing and hunting. Well, his tracks lead right to it. Yeah. Get on, boy. Come, Come on, Charky. Yeah, he stopped here all right. Oh, 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 oh. Flash your light on that door. Yeah. Yeah. Lock's been sprung. It's open. Yeah, he was here all right. Left his marks in the dust on the floor. I guess nobody's been using the place for quite a spell. Yeah. There's something else, too. Footlocker here. Lock on it's busted, too. Hmm. Shirts and jeans in there. I'd like to bet there's one set missing. 
Orville or whoever it was stopped here to change clothes. He must have known the setup. There's a funny smell in here, Sheriff, like the place had been smoked up not long ago. For something burning. Pot-bellied stove there. Yeah. Anything in it? Plenty. Clothes that didn't quite burn. Smells from kerosene he poured on him. But he came through the river so his pants were wet. Fire must have smoldered out after he left. Better pull those things out and see if we can save enough of them for identification. It's enough, all right. Look at this. Blood stain didn't even wash off when he came through the water. We prove who owns these things, and we've got our man. We'll be able to prove it. Look, shirt was bundled up with a wet pants, just enough to save most of the collar and this. Mm-hmm. Laundry mark. Let's get back to town. <laughs> got what we were after on our third laundry stop. A half-burned shirt belonged to Orville James. We went to his home. His wife was at the funeral parlor with Mrs. Prager, so he was there alone. What you want from me now? Sheriff's got a few things rolled up in that poncho. I thought maybe you might be able to identify them. Who? Who they belong to? Joe and Newcomb. We want you to tell us. All right, Sheriff, unroll them. Recognize these? What's the matter, Orville? You look kind of sick. Well, I'm just upset about Joe, that's all. I was at the funeral home with my sister almost all night. Well, you ever seen these things before? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen them. Whose are they? I could be wrong, I guess, but they look like Newton's. That's funny. Well, what's funny about it? Looks like they were burned quite a bit. Yeah, but they were too wet to burn all the way. Guess that gives you... A real tight case against you from now, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? A perfect case, except for the laundry mark on the shirt. Laundry mark? That's right, Orville, your laundry mark. But there can't be a laundry mark. There can't be a laundry Keep your hands off those things. You heard him, Orville. Let me go. Let me go. I... Oh, my arm. You better hold still. Come on. Let's go. My wife. My wife always hounding me for money. Always screaming about how hard she worked. Always yelling about how she was running her hands scrubbing greasy work shirts. But she wasn't. She was sending them out. Laundry box. A lazy pig. I'll kill her. I'll kill her. You're not going to kill anybody, Orville. Your killing days are over. Open the door, will you, Sheriff? Sure. All right, Orville. In the car. Let's go. Orville James broke down at his trial and confessed the robbery slaying of his brother-in-law. He was found guilty in less than 20 minutes and sentenced to Huntsville for the rest of his natural life. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of The Texas Rangers. McCray is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Freeze, Whitfield Connors, Sam Edwards, Harley Bear, and Barbara Luddy. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. This is Hal Gibney speaking. chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, the voice of Firestone presents Metropolitan Opera Basso, Cesare Sieppi, in a melodic variety of operatic selections. Your Monday evening of music also includes the telephone hour, and tomorrow's guest artist is the renowned coloratura soprano, Lily Pauls. Among this Pauls selections tomorrow is the beautiful aria from Rigoletto, Caranome. Phil Baker asks the $64 question next on NBC.